so uh, good evening all uh, i hope uh, you're all able to see me so welcome to this uh, special update on omicron so i know the people who are listening to me uh, me are mostly residents as well as interns so first of all i would like to salute the residents and interns who have been our frontline force in the fight against covid-19 i know most of uh, you are actually going through a tough time but definitely over a few weeks time i think this current wave is also going to end anyway you residents and intern has been the the force behind the treatment or like the management of covid-19 it's a pleasure for me to take this class that is omicron an update so myself dr mohammad niyas i am an infectious disease consultant i finished my dm in infectious disease from aims delhi and currently working in trivandrum and also also faculty in doc tutorials now this is a small disclaimer that i want to make this session's objective uh, is an academic discussion in the perspective of neat pg and neat super speciality and the intention is not to give any treatment recommendations so for the treatment recommendations kindly refer to the national as well as the state guidelines while treating patients with that again the virus that changed our lives we all know sars cov 2 and causing covid 19 So this particular virus is an RNA virus, which is an enveloped virus and has many proteins, as you can see. So the proteins include the nucleocapsid protein, which is associated with the RNA, which is shown as N in the picture. The membrane protein, that is M protein, the envelope protein, and the E protein. So there are many proteins, but our focus today will be on a particular protein called as the S protein or the spike protein. Now the spike protein is very important. because it is through the spike protein the virus binds to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 which is a receptor for covid-19 virus to enter our cells so basically there is a particular part on the the spike protein which is called as the receptor binding domain and it is through the receptor binding domain the sars cov 2 actually enters the human cell so this particular protein that is a spike protein is a very very important protein in the pathogenesis of covid-19 virus and any structural changes in this particular protein is going to affect the clinical features as well as the transmissibility of the virus now so the focus particular will be on the receptor binding domain of the spike protein and whenever a variant comes the main changes that is occurring will be in the spike protein receptor binding domain it is a mutations that are occurring in the receptor binding domain of the spike protein that we are mainly concerned about now how do variants arise as i've already told you the sars cov 2 enters the human cells by binding to the ac receptor once inside the cells the cells undergo replication by the virus replication machinery and as for all viruses the replication machinery of the sars cov 2 is not a full proof mechanism it can, there can a lot of errors that can occur and these errors what we call as mutations when these mutations are incorporated when these genetic elements with mutations are incorporated into the virus this results in the formations of mu, mu, the variants so the variants can further be classified as variants of interest or variants of concern now what are variants of interest and variants of concern this particularly is the definition that is given by the world health organization so variants of interest are those variants which has mutations that are suspected or known to cause a significant changes okay in the virus and it is circulating widely so there are mutations that has occurred in the virus which can cause significant changes in the virus and is circulating wide widely now a variant of interest becomes a variant of concern if it is known to spread more easily or cause more severe disease or can escape the body's immune response or the change clinical presentation or decrease effectiveness or treat of treatment or vaccine so a variant of, of interest which can spread faster which can cause a severe disease which can alter the change the clinical presentation or which have a decreased response to treatment of vaccine is called as a variant of concern 
Now, variant of concern is what we are also concerned with. Now, coming to the evolution of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So, the evolution of the SARS-CoV-2 virus as we can know, the first we had the wild virus which originated in Wuhan in 2019. From there in China itself there was a major mutation that occurred in the spike protein. This particular mutation was called as the D614G. So this mutation occurred on the 614th position where an aspartic acid was changed by glycine. This was a very very important step in the evolution of SARS-CoV-2. All the variants of concern that we have in circulation now actually originated from this particular variant and that is why this D614G strain is called as the mother of all variants. Now we have five COVID-19 variants of concern that has that, uh, like originated in various parts of the world and spread across the world. So these include the alpha variant which is also known as B117, the beta variant B1.351, the gamma variant P1, Delta variant which caused the second wave of COVID-19 in India that is B1.617.2 and the topic of discussion for today Omicron or B1.1.529. Now this is how the virus has evolved. Now this alpha, beta, gamma, delta or micron is a table which is given by the WHO for ease of understanding and used by lay person as well. Another system that is used to name the Variants are what is called as a pangolin lineage as I already told you this numbers that you can see as B1174 alpha or B1.6174 delta or B1.1.529 for Omicron. So these are actually uh, uh, what is called as a pangolin lineage nomenclature. Now I have shown in this particular uh, chart uh, the characteristics of all the five variants of concern. You need not remember all of them actually at least remember the delta. The pangolin lineage name is B1.617. Uh, it is, has an increased rate of transmission, has an increased severity. And against this, the particular treatment of COVID-19, that is monoclonal antibody, about which I will be talking later, all of these monoclonal antibodies were effective. On the other hand, Omicron, that is a variant B1.1.529, is a current variant, current variant which is maximum in circulation. It had increased transmission but clinically less severe and there is ineffectiveness against at least two of the monoclonal antibody. Only one monoclonal antibody that is sotrovimab is effective. Don't get confused about the monoclonal antibody. I'll be discussing about monoclonal antibody in detail later. Now coming to the topic proper Omicron. So where did it origin? In November 2021 the researchers from South Africa and Botswana identified a new variant on whole genome sequencing that is B1.1.529. This particular mutation, this variant had more than 50 mutations in genome and 32 of these mutations were in the spike protein and 10 of them were on the receptor binding domain. But Obviously, the researchers were scared. They knew that they have identified an important variant. It has many, many mutations in the receptor binding domain of the spike protein and this is going to alter the transmission, the severity of the virus and everybody was scared. And along with that, there was a rapid increase in the COVID-19 cases in South Africa and on 26 November 2021, the World Health Organization declared this B1.1.529 as a variant of concern and named it Omicron. So that is how it came into being. So the Omicron variant itself has four lineages B1.1.529 which originate, originated and sister lineages which is associated that includes BA1, BA2 and BA3. We have to remember BA2 because this is the most common circulating variant in India and it has some diagnostic importance as well. Now uh, this is the current situation as of 17th January 2022 uh, based upon the sequencing data in India you can see this light green here is the BA2 variant and currently the BA2 variant is dominating in India. This doesn't mean that it is going to be the same always there can be changes as you can see the BA2 is decreasing and the BA1 is increasing so this is dynamic as of now BA2 is the most commonly identified variant in India much much more than the Delta variant it has almost replaced Delta variant in the country. Now what has changed? 
in this particular virus because of the mutation that has occurred too many mutations in the spike protein more like around 10 mutations in the receptor binding domain so the omicron even the pathogenicity of the virus has changed when the virus is grown in vero cell cultures that is artificially created cell culture media it is found that its ability to produce plaques the ability to produce plaques actually indicates the pathogenicity of the virus actually omicron formed un, uh, formed less plaques or it was unlikely to cause plaques compared to other uh, variants and it also had a less ability to cause syncytia formation now syncytia formation that is a grouping together of various cells to form a large cell is one of the pathogenic mechanism of the COVID-19 virus in the lungs. Compared to other viruses, the ability of the Omicron variant to cause syncytia formation was actually less. And this particular variant, when they analyzed, it was also found that this particular variant had a preferential replication in the nasal epithelial and bronchial tissue. That is, the upper respiratory tract was more commonly involved in the Omicron variant when compared to the lower respiratory tract. We knew that the most of the uh, previous variant, especially in Delta, there was a significant involvement of the lung. There was many cases of ARDS due to the involvement of the lung. This is actually lung, uh, lesser in case of Omicron, which is considered as an important uh, change in the pathogenicity of the Omicron virus. Now, as a result, what has changed? So we know there are the mutations, the pathogenicity has changed, what has happened to the epidemiology as well as clinical feature of this particular variant. So as we know the transmissibility of this virus, you all will be knowing. It is spreading like wildfire and that is because this particular virus has replication advantage. It can spread faster, it can multiply faster and it also has the property of immune evasiveness. And it is also highly transmissible, transmitting from one person to another very fast. And the doubling time, that is to inc double the number of patients, the, the time required is two to four days. And the basic reproduction number of this particular variant is more than three. Now this also, as I've told, has the property of immune evasiveness. That is, the immunity that is generated by vaccines as well as prior COVID-19 is not going to protect you against an infection with the Omicron variant. As a result, there is an increased risk of reinfection and it is found to be 5.4 times more than that of Delta. So this virus has all these advantages. It has a replication advantage and it has an immune evasiveness. But as I told you, it preferentially involves the upper respiratory tract. ARDS are less. So, what we are seeing is a lesser severe clinical manifestations as I am coming to and there is also another other changes in the clinical features which includes a shorter incubation period that is previously the incubation period of the wild virus or the original Wuhan virus was five days for Omicron it is only two to three days and predominantly the symptoms of the virus are upper respiratory symptoms because it predominantly affects the upper respiratory tract the symptoms include running nose sore throat headache fatigue and sneezing and Compared to other variants, fever, cough are uncommon. It is not that it is not there. We see a lot of cases of fever, but it is uncommon compared to the previous variants. One thing that is definitely has changed is that the loss of smell and taste are much lesser compared to the previous variants. And it appears that there is a faster resolution of symptoms in these uh, patients based upon the literature as well as the patients that we are currently seeing. I mean, all, most of them getting recovered out of symptoms in a period of five to seven days. Now, is Omicron mild? Is it too early to say? Based upon the available literature, as well as my clinical experience, what I can say is that now we are seeing milder cases, lesser cases of ARDS. And we have data that AR, uh, the Omicron infection has lower risk of hospitalization, as well as the risk of serious disease, as well as death. It, it is mild in most of the patient. However, that doesn't mean that we can ignore it we should not be taking it seriously because we should understand that even if it is mild it can affect a large number of patients because it's too transmissible and as we understand the small percentage of a big number is still a big number even if it's affecting even if it is causing serious disease only in a small percentage of a population then actual numbers can be very high and if this numbers go high the healthcare system may be overwhelmed and we should be 
we should not be ignoring this particular variant we should be careful and continuing our covid appropriate behavior as well as the immunization drive which is one of the best in the world we have immunized a significant proportion of our population but we should continue our immunization drive to immunize all people who are eligible as well as also to give the third or the precautionary dose to all eligible persons in india now that is regarding the transmissibility as well as the clinical features of the virus and what has actually changed in the diagnostic any particular changes in diagnostic or any changes in identifying the virus now any variant as you know is identified by a technique called as whole genome sequencing by whole genome sequencing we will be able to identify any changes in the genetic structure of the virus uh the of the virus it can be even smaller changes and that is how the variants are identified as well as confirmed so omicron was also detected by whole genome sequencing now whole ge genome sequencing is a difficult process it's not done routinely in laboratories and is usually done in research laboratories and uh, it is not it, it is a time consuming technique and also is a uh, an ex uh, expensive kind of test so that is why we need other tests to detect the Uh, omicron variant so can rt pcr detect omicron now as we all know rt pcr usually uses primers against the covid genes so the commonly used genes include the e gene the n gene the r of gene the s gene now the primers attaches to this particular part of the gene and then the pcr amplifies it and that is how we diagnose covid 19 now omicron has this particular mutation remember this S6970 deletion as a result of which the primers cannot attach to the S gene as a result even if the other genes of the virus are amplified PCR cannot amplify the S gene and this phenomenon is called as S gene target failure now S gene target failure mean S gene alone is not amplified so this will give you a clue that this particular uh, sample that i am testing has omicron and not other variants so this S gene target failure is a surrogate marker for omicron now this is not very specific for omicron some of the alpha variants as well as some of the delta variants even can show sgtf but when omicron is spreading in the community you can take it as a surrogate marker of omicron so this will be a test of a person which an sgtf will look like so you can see that this particular pcr test for three genes okay this is a real result so you can see the n gene in this person is detected the or of 1a and b gene is detected plus the s gene alone is not detected so this phenomenon is called as s gene target failure sgtf it indicates this sample is likely to be omicron but the problem is that the omicron has i told you has sister lineages as well and one of the sister lineage is called as a ba2 variant lineage so this ba2 lineage actually the s6970 deletion is not present and as a result of which the s gene target failure cannot be used as a surrogate marker in this particular sister lineages and as we know this is the most common uh, lineage which is spreading in uh, india and this is also called as a stealth variant because sgtf cannot detect it so what we can do we can reduce the pcr we can reduce the sgtf do we have other methods to detect the virus yes so this is a particular kit that has been developed by the tata medical diagnostics and this particularly identifies uh, an s gene mutation okay that is associated with omicron so there are specific mutations that are associated with omicron and s gene and if we develop primer against that we can amplify these particular uh, mutated genes and as a result we can identify the particular virus and this particular kit is called as the omisure test which is developed by tata medical diagnostic and uh, we hope to be available uh, within a few days time across india and as a result we will be able to confirmly tell that whether a particular sample is omicron or not what happens to rapid antigen test now as i told you there are a lot of mutations in omicron and most of this mutation occurs in the spike protein and but there are mutation that can occur in other parts of the virus as well now most of the rapid antigen test actually detects a nucleocapsid antigen beyond the spike protein omicron also has some mutations in the nucleocapsid so there can be a some alteration in the sensitivity of rat that can be expected 
and this has been proved in studies as well they have shown that there is a slightly less analytical sensitivity of rapid diagnostic antigen test for omicron however this is very slight and it is unlikely to be important in clinical practice you can continue to use the rapid antigen test now we are going to the management part of covid-19 in omicron times so how do you manage a patient with covid-19 uh, in a in a community where omicron is prevalent so what we have to know is that before going to the clinical uh, the treatment options we also have to know uh, the clinical stages of covid-19 so the clinical stages as we know uh, the many cases of covid-19 can actually be asymptomatic and a significant number of it will be mild illness which is limited to the upper respiratory tract a majority of patients with omicron actually will fall into the mild illness category and when they have involvement of the lower respiratory tract clinically or by imaging but still maintaining a saturation more than 94 is called as moderate illness you call it as a severe disease when the saturation is less than 94 or the pao to fio2 ratio is less than 300 or a respiratory rate is more than 30 per minutes or you have a lung inflates more than 50 percentage in chest x-ray or ct scan and it is a critical illness when the patient develop respiratory failure and has a requirement for non invasive ventilation high flow oxygenation Uh, or uh, invasive mechanical ventilation or the patient is in septic shock or multi organ dysfunction so these are the various stages of covid-19 according to the stage of the illness the treatment differs so basically we have a mild illness uh, where there is upper respiratory symptoms and a moderate illness where there is lower res respiratory involvement but there is no hypoxia the saturation is still more than 94 once the saturation falls less than 94 the disease becomes severe and once the patient requires organ support it goes to respiratory failure requires uh, invasive or non invasive ventilation or ecmo or the patient has shock or multi organ dysfunction that goes to a critical illness so the treatment differs but what i have to tell you is that most of the cases of omicron are mild diseases and only a few uh, actually goes into the severe disease and also there is a difference in the clinical manifestation uh, of the virus like the virus in different stages uh, Uh, because of the difference in the pathogenic mechanism in the initial period of the viral infection the clinical manifestation that we see that is fever cough loss of smell etc are actually due to the viral replication this actually lasts for around 7 to 10 days and from the second week actually the clinical manifestation are actually due to the host immune response there is an inflammatory response which sometimes get exaggerated and gets out of control Uh, and there is a hyper responsiveness of the immune system which is actually the cause of the severe illness as well as critical illness which is predominantly caused by the inflammation of the body so during the initial mild to moderate period you are targeting the virus so the treatment in this part of the illness will be uh, targeting the virus which include antivirals as well as monoclonal antibody that specifically targets the virus but the second part of the uh, disease it's predominantly inflammation and our treatment here will be to decrease the inflammation so that is how the treatment of the covid-19 be it any variant differs okay a micron delta or whatever may be it differs according to the stage of the disease now most of the case patients of omicron as i told you it will be mild illness without much of a comorbidities and the major rule here is that rule one is that do no harm do not treat this patients with antivirals do not treat this patients with monoclonal antibodies do not give them steroids do not use azithromycin hydroxychloroquine doxycycline none of them are actually required just give them antipyretics and some rest all of them will i mean most of them will recover by themselves just do no harm by polypharmacy uh, medications without any evidence as we have seen it uh, in the initial two waves a uh, lot of medicines without evidences were given doxycycline ivermectin hydroxychloroquine azithromycin we should not be giving as modern medicine practitioners practitioners of evidence based medicine we should not be giving this uh, uh, these treatments without any evidences just leave the patient alone give him paracetamol give him rest these patients will recover now that is not the case when the patient has risk factors for progression so what are the risk factors for, for progression it can be advanced in the age age more than 60 or it can be uh, other risk factors including obesity a bmi more than 25 
or concomitant chronic illnesses. It can be hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, immunosuppressive uh, drug intake, HIV infections, other blood disorders, all of these uh, rheumatic diseases, all of these patients had an increased risk of development of a severe disease. Such patients you should consider two therapies that is monoclonal antibodies as well as antiviral medicines. Now monoclonal antibodies are antibodies that are engineered to specifically target a particular antigen and in this case it will be the spike protein of the COVID-19 virus. So we have three monoclonal antibodies uh, available across the world. The one is Casirivimab, Imdivimab, second is Sotrovimab, third is Bamlanivimab, Etasivimab. And definitely these names are very difficult to remember and you need not remember all of them. Remember this drug, Casirivimab, Imdivimab, because this is one drug which has been used in India. It is available in India, used extensively. Now, Casirivimab, Imdivimab, also known as region COVID-2 monoclonal antibody cocktail. Why is it called as a monoclonal antibody cocktail? Because it is a combination of two monoclonal antibodies. These are IgG monoclonal antibodies and each of these monoclonal antibodies, Casirimab target a particular part of the SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain and Imdivimab targets another part. So it will inhibit the virus by binding to the receptor binding particular areas on the receptor binding domain on the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now the antibodies, IgG monoclonal antibodies uh, bind to two distinct and non-overlapping sites on the receptor binding domain and uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. We have to understand one thing is that this particular monoclonal antibody unfortunately is not effective against the Omicron variant. Okay, Casitimab, Imdivimab is not effective against the Omicron uh, variant. Also, the second monoclonal antibody that is Bamlanivimab, Etasivimab is also not effective against uh, Omicron variant. So, these two monoclonal antibodies are out. So, what we have? We have the third monoclonal antibody that is Sotrovimab. Now, Sotrovimab is an engineered human monoclonal antibody that neutralizes SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1. So, it is an antibody with broad range of action particularly target a conserved epitope on the spike protein but that is not receptor binding domain. So it binds outside the receptor binding domain and it is not affected by the mutations that are occurred in Omicron. As a result it is expected to be effective against Omicron. We don't have any clinical data. We have a trial called as the Comet ICE trial where Sotrovimab was found to decrease the rate of hospitalization. Sotrovimab was found to decrease the rate of hospitalization and death by 85 percentage. But this trial did not include patients who had the Omicron variant. But we expect, based on the mutations, we expect that Sotrovimab may be spared. Now coming to the antivirals, I will be discussing three particular antivirals in this juncture. That is Remdesivir, Molnupiravir and Nirmatrelvir Ritonavir. I will not be discussing Favipiravir because the Favipiravir is a medicine which is not supported by much of an evidence and that is the reason why I will not be discussing Favipiravir. So the first drug, antiviral drug that was approved uh, for the treatment for COVID-19 was Remdesivir. It is an adenosine nucleoside triphosphate analyte which inhibit analog which inhibits RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So RNA dependent RNA polymerase is an enzyme which is required for the replication of the virus and the particular antibody which is an ATP analog goes and inhibit the RDRP. So it has to be, uh, be given as an intravenous medication and where is it used? The current AIMS guideline says that it has to be used within 10 days of onset of symptoms in patients requiring supplemental oxygen but who are not on invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO. So supplemental oxygen requirement, we know that these belong to severe disease group. So but I am talking you regarding mild to moderate diseases. So what, why are we talking about Remdesivir here? This is because of a recent trial that has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This particular trial is called as the Pine Tree Trial where they have tried remdesivir in non-hospitalized high-risk individual with COVID-19 early in the part of the disease. So this particular study was done in predominantly patients who had the D614G mutation as well as the alpha mutations. So it was done in non-hospitalized high-risk individuals who had symptoms less than 70s. 
okay it is not as the uh, current national guidelines is uh, as of now the national guidelines does not recommend early treatment with remdesivir it may change based upon this particular randomized control trials so when these patients were given remdesivir early in the part of the disease there was an 87 percentage decrease in the covid 19 associated hospitalization or death so remdesivir when given early that is within seven days for three days okay in the severe disease we give it for five days early disease we give it for three days so three days remdesivir decrease the hospitalization risk as well or the risk for death by 87 percentage by the pine tree rct again stressing this particular indication the national guidelines has not included remdesivir for this particular indications it may change later now we have the second drug which is molnupiravir you all would have heard so molnupiravir is a pyrimidine ribonucleoside analog again it as a pyrimidine analog it incorporates to the viral rna and induces mutations and inhibits the rdrp now in a particular trial called as the move out trial this particular drug decreased the risk of hospitalization or death by 30 percent this drug has to be given within a period of five days since the symptom onset it has teratogenic potential it can interfere with cartilage growth and that is why this particular drug is contraindicated in pregnancy as well as age less than 18 years now if you look at the move out trial this reduction of hospitalization or death was only 30 percent this is not very impressive so you have to consider all these factors before you use this drug for covid 19 you have to use only this drug again was tried only in patients with high risk okay not in routine population there is no need to use it the trial move out trial was conducted in patients who had risk factors again the risk in reduction of hospitalization was only 30 percent and that is the reason why this particular drug is not included in the national guidelines for covid 19 be very careful if you are using it the teratogenic can interfere with cartilage group do not use it in pregnant women also avoid in women who are in the reproductive age group now the third drug is called as nirmatrelvir ritonavir also called as paxlovid this drug was also tried for high risk individuals who are non hospitalized unfortunately this particular drug is not available in india now how does nirmatrelvir ritonavir act it is a combination of two drugs both of them are uh, inhibitors of the viral proteases so the viral proteases as a particular enzyme inside the virus the covid 19 when the rna of the covid 19 is translated it's first translated to a large polyprotein to make them functional it has to be cleaved into various subunit protein and this cleaving is actually done uh, by a particular enzyme called as protease now this protease inhibited by this particular drug that is called nirmatrelvir as well as retinavir which is given as a combination and this again it was tried in patients who were high risk uh, uh, patients who were at high risk for covid 19 and were non hospitalized and which should be given uh, uh, within a period of five days from symptom onset this particular uh, trial called as the epic hr trial which analyzed the role of paxlovid or nirmatrel viritanavir for a non hospitalized patient with covid 19 found that it reduced the risk of hospitalization or death by 89 percentage this is impressive this is a drug which is definitely going to be uh, making much of a changes we expect it to be available in india soon so but the problem with nirmatrel viritanavir is that a lot of drug interactions uh, you will not be i mean this is not will not be new news for you because you all know that protease inhibitors are associated with a lot of drug interactions from hiv medicines okay protease inhibitors we have been using them in hiv medicines so mostly these drugs are cyp3a inhibitor so nirmatrel as well as retinavir are cyp3a inhibitor so when used with pyroxicam, amiodron, colchicine, clozapine, lovastatin and simvastatin. This drug increases the levels of uh, the mentioned drug. That is, if you use nirmatrelvir, retinavir, it will increase the blood levels of pyroxicam, amiodron, colchicine, clozapine, lovastatin and simvastatin. Now, it also, on the other hand, CYP3A induces. So, inducer drugs, you would have learned in your pharmacology, carbamazepine, phenobarbital, phenytoin and rifampicin 
will increase the metabolism that is will induce the CYP3 uh, enzyme, increase the metabolism and decrease the levels of the dermatrel retinoid. So one particular thing that you have to be aware about this particular drug is that there are a lot of drug interactions that you have to consider before you prescribe it to any patients. Just as a summary, as you know, the virus enters to the uh, by attaching to the AC receptor. From there, the RNA of the virus is changed to the uh, I mean, uh, RNA is released. The RNA is translated to a polyprotein, and the polyprotein is actually uh, cleaved into multiple subunit protein. And the subunit protein, some of them combine to form what is a replicase complex, which include the RDRP protein as well. And by the help of the replicase complex, a virus uh, multiplies. It uh, makes multiple copies of the RNA. Now this area where the viral multiplication occurs by the help of the RDRP protein is where molnupiravir act. On the other hand, the nirmatrelvir retinavir act by inhibiting proteolysis that is at this point. So that is what we have to know about the mechanism of action. So just a comparison between the two oral uh, antivirals for COVID-19. So the mechanism of action for molnupiravir is inhibiting of RDRP whereas it for nirmatrelvir it is the inhibition of the main protease inhibitor. Both of these drugs actually are not acting on the spike protein and as a result the variation in spike protein is unlikely to affect its efficacy. As a result it is it has been effective against Delta and it's expected to be effective against Omicron as well. As I told you this has to be used in patients with risk towards progression of severe COVID and should be non-hospitalized and should be used within five days of onset of symptoms. Due to the risk of cartilage damage, Moldoperavir should only be used in age more than 18 years, whereas Nirmatrelvirutinavir can be used from 12 years. Renal and hepatic dose adjustments are not required for Moldoperavir. While for Nirmatrelvir, you have to reduce the dose if the GFR is less than 60, you have to avoid it if the GFR is less than 30, and avoid in child C cirrhosis. The warnings and side effects, most important side effects is teratogenicity or embryo fetal toxicity with monopiravir as well as bone and cartilage toxicity. Whereas for nirmatrelvirutinavir, it's drug interactions and hepatotoxicity. We have already mentioned about the drug interactions. As of now, monopiravir is available in India, but only for restricted emergency use, not included in the national guidelines. Nirmatrelvirutinavir as of now is not available in India. Now, coming to the second part of the uh, disease, once the patient is hospitalized or has severe diseases, severe disease means there is a saturation drop, they are hypoxic or the saturation is less than 94. This is a stage in which the pathogenesis of the virus is entirely, I mean the disease is entirely different, it is inflammation. Uncontrolled host inflammatory response is the reason for the clinical manifestation at this particular uh, period of the virus illness. So as a result, our therapeutics at this particular point of time will be to reduce the inflammation, to decrease the inflammation. So what are the treatment modalities that we use? We use corticosteroids, interleukin-6 inhibitors and JAK-1-2 inhibitors. Now what we have to note is that the inflammatory response actually will not depend upon the variant. Definitely it will uh, decide what percentage of the patients will go to this inflammatory response. But once the inflammation sets in, the treatment will be the same for all the variant. So this particular part of the treatment, there is no change for Omicron. It is the same as that is for previous variants. You have to decrease the inflammation you give the same treatment. But the number of patients who are going to need this particular treatment will actually will be less because not many patients are going to this inflammatory kind of response in uh, Omicron variant. So corticosteroids, this has been one of the major advancement in the therapeutics of COVID-19. And because it's a much cheap drug and has been found to decrease uh, mortality, it was a first intervention in COVID-19 which was found to decrease mortality. So this has to be given only for patients who are on supplemental oxygen, that is an oxygen saturation less than 94, or who are on ventilatory support. So what steroids you have to use? You can use dexamethasone or methylprednisolone. Indian National Guidelines says methylprednisolone. The maximum data for this particular drug, that is corticosteroids, comes from a large trial in the UK called as the recovery trial, where they use dexamethasone 6 milligram 
and looked what is the reduction in 28 day mortality when you use this particular drug. So dexamethasone at this dose at 6 mg they found that when it was given to patients who required uh, supplemental oxygen the overall decrease in mortality was 70% reduction in mortality and if the patient was on invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO the reduction in mortality was 36%. So cheap drug but a significant reduction in mortality. Now, certain group of patients uh, the inflammations cannot be controlled by corticosteroid alone it goes even if you are giving steroids the inflammation continues and the patient goes into hyper inflammatory state what is known as a cytokine release syndrome like presentation and many of these patients actually die so uh, we were in search of molecules which can inhibit uh, the inflammation further and that is why there were many trials which was uh, done using the interleukin 6 inhibitors most of them which was done using a particular molecule called as tocilizumab so tocilizumab is an interleukin 6 inhibitor why we chose tocilizumab many of the studies found that the levels of interleukin 6 was actually very very high in severe covid 19 so the scientists postulated that if we decrease the inflammation by blocking the interleukin 6 we may be able to reduce the inflammation and also prevent the tissue damage so, tocilizumab has been found to be redu to reduce the mortality in COVID-19 patients in at least two large trials. So, the current criteria for use for tocilizumab is rapidly deteriorating COVID-19, requiring supplemental oxygen, invasive mechanical ventilation, not responding to steroids. And this track has to be started within 24 to 48 hours of organ support. By organ support, we means that initiation on high flow nasal oxygen, non-invasive ventilation, invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO. Once you start any of this respiratory support, you have to start tocilizumab within 24 to 48 hours. You should not wait beyond that. Only then you will get the correct, I mean the real benefit of this particular drug. And on all the trials where they studied tocilizumab, only the trials in which it was used along with steroids, the benefit was found. So this drug has to be given along with steroids and again it is a sputum immunosuppressant drug you have to rule out infections and also in our guidelines said that the inflammatory markers should be high the levels of CRP or interleukin 6 should be high to uh, qualify for giving a person tocilizumab. Now another drug and a group of drug which has been tried in uh, COVID-19 in the inflammatory phase is Janus kinase 1, 2 inhibitor. Now, if you look at the figure, the COVID-19 causes this lot of inflammation, losses, lot of cytokines and the effect part of the cytokines actually occurs through a receptor and there is a downward signal pathway what is called as the JAK stat pathway. This JAK stands for Janus kinase. So the Janus kinase involved in the signal transduction of the cytokines so when you block the Janus kinase the action of the uh, action of the particular drugs that is uh, sorry uh, the action of the cytokines actually can be decreased that is or it can be mitigated so that is what is the reason behind the rationale behind the introduction of these particular drugs against COVID-19 these are not new drugs baricitinib and tofacitinib by the Janus kinase inhibitor has been used in rheumatoid arthritis even previously now so what we did was we postulated that this drugs particularly can decrease the inflammation and this was tried in two trials uh, it was found that patient requiring high flow oxygen or non-invasive ventilation baricitinib can decrease mortality the advantage of this particular intervention it is an oral drug so in patients who are deteriorating on steroids inflammation despite being on steroids it is an alternative to tocilizumab. You should not use it along with tocilizumab. It's an alternative to tocilizumab. And another Janus kinase inhibitor that you can use is tofacitinib. Okay. Baricitinib was recently approved by the WHO for the treatment of COVID-19. It's a much cheaper alternative to tocilizumab. We never give it together. We only give either of them. We give either tocilizumab or baricitinib, but not together. Now, vaccine efficacy against Omicron is, uh, I have completed the treatment part. Now, what about vaccines? Will the vaccines work? Definitely, we all know that the vaccine efficacy will be lesser. Why? Because there are a lot of mutations in the spike protein. Most of the vaccines are actually directed against the spike protein. 
including the adenoviral vector vaccines like the covid shield vaccine as well as the mrna vaccines all of them are actually directed against the spike protein unlike our covaxin which is an inactivated whole cell vaccine which is not actually uh, which is directed against many of the antigens anyway we don't expect a good degree of protection with the current two doses of uh, covid-19 vaccines against omicron and this has been proven in the laboratory also where there is found to have a substantial fall in the neutralizing titers against omicron in sera collected six months after two doses of vaccine so definitely it's going to be less but how less and will it pro protect against severe disease is our question we are sure that breakthrough infections are going to occur but will these breakthrough infections will be severe or not is an important question so what we are seeing is that even now most of the severe infections are continuing to be occurring in unvaccinated patients which means that there is some degree of protection which is given by the two doses of vaccine against severe diseases we need real world data regarding this but my clinical impression is that the two doses of vaccine are still protecting against severe diseases and in at risk patients we have started the precautionary dose there is a third dose which will increase the immunity level or increase the, increase the antibody levels and will further will decrease the risk of uh, severe disease due to omicron on the other hand, if you look at, again, as I told you, the antibody levels has diminished over time. But the CD4 and CD8 T cell response remains uh, not much affected, actually. It's more than 80% actually preserved. Uh, 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 that is what we understand. So basically, there will be some role of, definitely some immunity will be remaining. The T cell may help us in preventing from going to the severe disease. Data regarding this will require uh, further studies and uh, regarding the Omicron. Every day we are getting new studies and uh, through various other clinical studies, we expect to have a cl clear picture on the vaccine efficacy against Omicron. And various vaccine manufacturers have started developing vaccines specifically uh, against this particular variant. So we have to see how effective it is as well as how easy it is to roll out uh, vaccine against each variant. So that is from me. Uh, all uh, my juniors who are uh, watching this, stay safe uh, yourself. Okay, you're all uh, frontline workers, uh, frontline warriors against COVID-19. So all of you stay safe. And uh, in a few weeks time, we will be able to tide over this third way, I'm sure. Uh, this is my Facebook as well as uh, Twitter uh, IDs. Uh, so in Facebook, it's Nias Medicine. And in, uh, uh, that's in Facebook and Twitter, it's Nias987. Any doubts that you have, uh, you can feel uh, free to contact me through this social media channels. And I'll be uh, uploading uh, updates regarding infectious diseases, not just COVID-19, uh, which will be useful for your entrance preparation as well. So that is it from me. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take any questions. So uh, one question uh, that has uh, uh, been uh, shown is by, I mean asked is by Malik Venkit. Uh, regarding a news regarding a new core virus i was also just seeing it in the whatsapp i mean lots of whatsapp messages uh, unscientific things are being uh, getting circulated uh, nowadays so neo uh, core virus is actually a virus it's a bad coronavirus uh, this virus has not been not a single case of human infection has been reported so far some scientist has said that this could be a potential human pathogen so the news me uh, people took it and spread it like wildfire. So you don't have to be worried about this particular variant, new core variant as of now, don't worry. So no problem with that. Uh, Naresh Kumar has asked if there is any change in isolation guidelines. So the current guidelines as per Indian guide, uh, uh, in government is that if you are COVID positive, you have to remain in isolation for seven days, okay? Seven days from symptom onset, and there is no need for any repeat testing. So this is regarding uh, the guide, I mean, isolation guideline regarding the Indian uh, government is concerned. But uh, if you uh, consider like the CDC, that is the United States uh, Center for Disease Control, they have reduced the isolation period to five days. If you don't have symptoms at the day five, you can remove isolation and continue to, I mean, you can remove isolation and continue to work with your mask on. 
so the isolation guidelines will keep changing as of now in india it is seven days now uh, anti coagulation i have not touched upon anti coagulation because there is not much of an update in anti coagulation with omicron anti coagulation is a topic of debate current national guidelines particularly recommend only uh, prophylactic anti coagulation but we have had trials in which it was shown that of anticoagulation that is therapeutic anticoagulation okay therapeutic anticoagulation decreased mortality in moderate diseases that is moderate disease to severe disease that is in patients who require oxygen but not in critical ill patients so once the patient require invasive mechanical ventilation and ecmo it was found that the prophylactic anticoagulation actually did not matter much in the moderate to severe disease group there was a benefit in therapeutic anticoagulation so in that group you can try therapeutic anticoagulation in critically ill patients prophylactic anticoagulation but the current government guidelines national guidelines is to give prophylactic anticoagulation for all any other questions any role of aspirin after severe disease as of now we don't have any randomized controlled trials which has shown a benefit of aspirin in covid-19 so as of now no there are trials going on but as of now no uh what of uh, advising the alternate dose as a booster now this is called as heterologous vaccination so which means that if you give a uh, adenoviral vector vaccine like covishield now you give an, another vaccine as the booster that is a uh, mrna vaccine or covaxin as a booster this is called as heterologous vaccination heterologous vaccination definitely has advantages it has proven to increase the antibody level compared to giving the same vaccine so many trials have shown that ideal situation it is the correct approach also but unfortunately it has a lot of logistical issues to roll out it in a country as large as india will be difficult so the government of india has said that in indian vaccination drive we will continue to give the same vaccine which was used in the first two two doses as the third dose also so we will continue to give the third dose uh, i mean the same vaccine as the third dose also as of now in india heterologous vaccination is not allowed i hope it's clear so i feel that the questions are over uh, i hope it can be we can wind it up thank you all uh, thank you for attending and thank you for uh, the uh, discussion uh, in which you all participated and uh, as i told you you can contact me through the uh, facebook as well as twitter channels that i provided i'll be happy to answer your questions related to infectious diseases uh, or covid 19 uh, good night all thank you